On December 21, 1994, disaster struck in the British town of Coventry just four days before Christmas. What became an already devastating scene narrowly avoided further fatal consequences as a Boeing 737 clipped the tops of nearby homes before crashing into a wooded area nearby to the local airport, also damaging other infrastructure. What makes this story so intriguing is that for one thing, the purpose of this very flight was actually pretty controversial and unusual. When I tell you that this plane came from the Netherlands but belonged to the national airline of Algeria, one may have some questions as to just what this plane was doing in Coventry. Secondly, this is almost a forgotten incident. For the people of Coventry, this was a very localized accident that didn't really get much nationwide coverage at the time, and again, very little since. So what was the deal with this mystery plane and why did it crash? So as stated, this was a rather unusual flight. To break down and unravel this mess, we need to look at the background of the accident plane. This was a Boeing 737-200, registered as 7 Tango Victor Echo Echo. Built in 1973, it was delivered to Air Algerie of Algeria, fresh off the production line. At some point during its life, the Axton plane was actually converted into a freight plane and a new modified large opening door was fitted onto the fuselage. In the weeks before the accident, a British-based air operator by the name of Phoenix Aviation got in contact with Air Algerie for a request to lease the plane. The lease went through, Air Algerie supplied their flight crew and the plane's interior was adjusted again this time to accommodate what the accident report calls palletized livestock pens. For you see, this plane was not to carry humans, but was for the transport of animals, livestock. The new leaseholder of this aircraft then began operating the plane for the transport of livestock out of the United Kingdom. It was flown to Coventry and began operations there on November 5th, 1994. Specifically, Veal calves were driven into Coventry Airport from all over the country and were loaded onto this plane utilizing the aforementioned pens. The 737 would then make a short one hour hop to Amsterdam where the veal calves were then distributed across the European continent. The plane would then fly back to Coventry empty. That is the rundown of what this plane was doing in late 1994. It was actually controversial. There was pushback for the flights from animal rights groups and local residents and protests were a daily occurrence at Coventry Airport. Tangential to our discussion today, one protester was actually killed in 1995 from being crushed from a lorry delivering calves into Coventry Airport. The flights were eventually stopped in 1996 following the outbreak of mad cow disease in the United Kingdom. Focusing back on our ill-fated plane, the Boeing 737 made a numerous amount of these flights to and from Coventry and Amsterdam throughout November and into December. On December 18th, a new crew had been flown in from Algeria and for a few days before the accident, they were still familiarizing themselves with Coventry and the Amsterdam route. They began work in the very early hours of the morning on December 21st. A round trip between Coventry and Amsterdam was completed successfully with the plane arriving back at Coventry at 3.42 a.m., the first of two trips that morning. Preparations were made for the second outing. New livestock was loaded and the flight to Amsterdam also went off uneventfully and was due to fly back empty as usual. Departing Amsterdam at 6.42 as Phoenix Flight 702 Papa, this 737 embarked on its final flight. On board were just five people, two employees of Phoenix Aviation who managed the livestock, one Air Algerie mechanic, and the two pilots, whose names I wasn't able to find at time of recording this video. Here is what we do know about the pilots though. The captain, a 44-year-old man, was actually highly experienced with over 10,000 flight hours logged. He had flown a variety of different planes, having been with Air Algerie for many years. 
The first officer, a 35-year-old man, was much less experienced, with just under 3,000 total flight hours. The two pilots, though, had spent roughly the same amount of time in the 737, just over 2,000 each. Weather in the United Kingdom that morning was already cold, wet and foggy, and conditions only worsened as the morning progressed. Visibility at Coventry dropped from over 20 kilometers when the pilots left to just 800 meters by the time they left Amsterdam. Normally, low visibility is not really an issue. Pilots on planes such as the 737 can be guided to a runway with the help of the Instrument Landing System, ILS. The approach usually given at Coventry was ILS Runway 23, the southwesterly facing runway. There was, however, a slight complication between the ILS and the plane. To put it simply, the radio equipment installed on the Axton 737 could pick up a total of 20 radio channels. When the plane was first built in 1973, 20 radio channels that could be used for the ILS had sufficed in most circumstances. The specific radio frequency that the Coventry Airport ILS would broadcast its signal on was not on any of these 20 channels the plane could pick up. Coventry is nestled away in a rather dense area of the United Kingdom. There are a number of airports nearby, all with ILS equipment. Over the years as the technology rolled out, it became apparent that more than 20 channels were needed to avoid conflict with other airports. Airplane radios could be modified to pick up this new 40 channel range, except this was only ever done at the operator's discretion. When it was discovered that this plane was effectively incompatible with the airport's ILS, this information was forwarded to both Phoenix and Air Algerie, but no action was taken to upgrade the radio capabilities of the plane. Instead, pilots of this aircraft usually navigated to Coventry by use of the VOR beacon at the airport, and visual approaches were conducted as the norm. All of this meant that on that foggy morning in December 1994, the pilots couldn't confidently land at Coventry. When Flight 702 Papa was within reach of the airport, they remained in a holding pattern in the hope that weather conditions would improve. Visibility, though, continued to drop to below 600 meters. With no sign of improvement, the plane was diverted to East Midlands Airport, around 30 miles north, where it arrived uneventfully at 8.08. Flight 702 Papa would stay on the ground at East Midlands for around 90 minutes. In that time, weather would improve at Coventry. A visibility of 1,200 meters was recorded at just after 9 a.m. There was a telephone call made between Coventry and East Midlands to forward that information to the crew. At 9.38, the 737 was airborne again for the short flight back down to Coventry. This lag was a bit of a mess. After all, this was when the accident occurred. For one thing, the plane was in the air for a matter of minutes before preparations needed to be made for landing, so there was a lot that needed to be done in that time. At one point, controllers needed to issue an immediate turning instruction to avoid conflict with another aircraft. And then there was also some confusion as to what approach should be taken at Coventry. As we've already established, the plane couldn't utilize the ILS for runway 23, and the conditions really still weren't good enough for a visual approach. There was, however, another option, even in limited visibility. In communication with a controller in Coventry, the pilots were advised if they would like to take a surveillance radar approach, or SRA. A surveillance radar approach basically means that the pilots will be guided in with the help of air traffic control. The pilots would be following altitude instructions on the airport charts, whilst the air traffic controller would be issuing lateral guidance with the help of their radar. This guidance service would be terminated just a couple of miles from touchdown, and landing clearance would be given later in the approach. When the captain of Flight 702 Papa received this approach option, he seemed to need further confirmation as to what that actually meant. Before further clarity could be given, the pilots were already caught up in configuring their plane, flaps were being extended and checklists performed. According to the cockpit voice recording transcript, the captain asked if the approach would be using something called an SRE, Surveillance Radar Element. 
a seemingly general radar term that doesn't seem to have that much relevance. The controller reiterated that the approach was SRA, Surveillance Radar Approach, for Runway 23. Still, they continued with the help of controllers under the rules of SRA. For that SRA approach, there is what is called an obstacle clearance height. This is exactly what it sounds like. It's the height of the tallest obstacle in an area, so it's the altitude that a plane should keep above to avoid conflict. The plane, though, should still stay on an ideal glide path, but not descend below this height. Initially, when the controller gave the pilots the SRA, she did so with the plan to terminate service at 2 miles. The pilots needed to be informed that the obstacle clearance height was 650 feet at 2 miles. Following the confusion, she changed her mind and would now terminate at 1 mile, with an obstacle clearance height of 370 feet. None of this information was forwarded to the pilots ahead of time. So let's now take a moment to discuss what was between Coventry Airport and the plane that was now around 10 miles out from runway 23. Before reaching the airport, Flight 702 Papa needed to pass over parts of Coventry itself, namely the residential neighbourhoods of Binley, yes, that Binley, and Willenhall. After passing over the homes of residents, the flight path would take the 737 over a small wooded area and the A46 dual carriageway that bypasses the airport. The landing gear was lowered and the flaps extended. At 9 miles, the pilots were advised that a glide path of 3 degrees should be used at 4.5 miles from the airport. The SRA approach meant that the controller was in almost constant communication with the plane as it descended. She would check in with altitude information, telling the pilots what altitude the plane should be at when passing through decreasing mile markers. This was all clearly recorded in the CBR transcript. Flight 702 Papa was guided onto the correct runway heading. Out from their windows in the fog, the pilots couldn't see the runway. Five miles out from the airport. The heading of the aircraft on the controller's end looked good. However, what the controller did not have was an accurate reading of the plane's altitude. Flight 702 Papa had actually descended below the glide path. We'll talk more about why that might have happened later. The controller did not know this. They only had notes as to what altitude the plane should be at at different points. The pilots had failed to follow the SRA approach as needed and were getting closer to the ground. The time was 9.52. The plane began passing over Binley at a substantially low altitude. Less than two miles from the runway, landing clearance was given and the SRA service was terminated. The pilots still never saw the runway, but evidently continued on. In the following moments, the accident plane that was less than one minute to disaster passed over a supermarket, an industrial estate, recreational field belonging to a local community centre, and the railway tracks of the West Coast mainline. Remember that concept of the obstacle clearance height? At two miles from the runaway, the controller stated that their height should have been 650 feet. This was the obstacle clearance height. The 737 had descended well below that. So what obstacle could have been in their path? Let's look at the map again. Here is where this plane was. If you look at satellite imagery of this site today, you'll see it has been developed into housing in recent years. Before then, this site was an almost empty field. Once passing over the railway tracks, the plane flew into Willenhall where this field is located. By the time it had reached this field, the 737 was at an altitude just under 100 feet above the ground. This was where disaster struck. But it doesn't seem like the kind of place that, at first glance, would contain a tall obstacle that would tower 100 feet above the ground. Except, there was one thing. This was an almost empty field, aside from the fact that it was used to carry electricity lines over ground. An electricity pylon happened to be positioned directly under the flight path of incoming aircraft for runway 23 at Coventry. These electricity pylons are massive structures made of a steel lattice, 
and in this particular case, towered at a height of 86 feet. They are extremely common in the United Kingdom, especially nearby to arterial roads, just like this one. This pylon appeared in the pilot's view, possibly without much warning as indicated on the CVR transcript, which depicts an exclamation before the recording simply ends. The 737 struck the pylon with its left wing, impacting at an altitude of around 72 feet. In the moment the plane struck the pylon, power was cut to several local surrounding areas including Coventry Airport. The power went down for a total of 10 seconds, so for those in the airport such as the controller working that morning, the first indication that something was wrong was when the power went out. Severe damage was done to the plane's left wing and left engine. The accident report describes how the asymmetry of the lifting and thrust forces led to a loss of control. Because a massive disruption of lift and thrust had occurred on the left side, whilst the right side was still producing that energy as normal, it began to lift the right side, leading to an uncontrollable roll to the left. The roll continued until the plane was inverted. The remnants of the left wing struck this particular house highlighted here, which is the end home in a row of four. The plane continued on its back narrowly avoiding numerous other homes on the corner of Middle Ride and crashed upside down into this wooded area. All five of the plane's occupants were killed when the 737 crashed. When power returned to Coventry Airport, they attempted to contact the aircraft with no response. The question still remains, why did the pilots fly too low to the ground in the first place? The pilots are dead. We don't know what was going on in their minds in those final moments before disaster. But investigators have put forward some suggestions. One idea that was explored was the possibility that the flight crew mistook the A46 road for the runaway. There is a stretch of the road in this region that almost runs parallel to the runaway right under the flight path. One perhaps could understand if that were the case, but investigators were left skeptical of this thought. The daylight sensitive roadway lighting would have turned itself off at around 8.30 that morning, whereas the runaway lights would have stayed illuminated in the fog. The effects of tiredness and fatigue were also explored. The pilots worked all through the early morning hours and having arrived in the United Kingdom just a few days previously to perform this work, their circadian rhythms, that is their body clocks, may not have fully adjusted to their new schedule. And by the time the plane crashed, they had all worked a shift in excess of 10 hours. The accident report describes how tired pilots will lead to decreased reaction times, mistakes in familiar locations, leave radio calls unanswered, attention drifting elsewhere other than flying the plane, and interestingly, an increased willingness to accept lower standards. The accident plane was fitted with a ground proximity warning system, so why didn't it sound when the plane was about to crash? Logically, this is the exact thing it's supposed to prevent. To answer this, the plane was properly configured for landing. The aircraft's own attitude reflected this. The GPWS didn't activate because as far as the plane as a machine was concerned, it looked like the plane was in a normal landing position, and so didn't send any warning to the pilots. The investigation put the accident down as pilot error induced by the effects of tiredness. The plane flew into fog with limited instrument capabilities and the pilots inadvertently drifted below the intended glide path until it struck that electricity pylon leading to disaster. It is also highlighted that there was a failure by the pilot not flying to make appropriate altitude callouts, not to mention that a cross check of altitude with the airport charts is believed not to have taken place. In the safety recommendations, Airport and approach procedures were to be reviewed, as would the standardization of the phraseology. A new crew training program was suggested for Air Algeri, with a review of the airline itself to be conducted by Algerian aviation authorities. That may have been difficult to do in 1994, 
given that Algeria was gripped by civil war at the time. In fact, just three days after the accident, an international aviation crisis unfolded in Algeria in the case of Air France Flight 8969. To learn more about that, consider watching our video on that incident. As mentioned earlier in this video, the transportation of cows out of Coventry continued until 1996, coinciding with the outbreak of mad cow disease in the country. Coventry Airport is still open today, although it's not really an airport that serves commercial passenger traffic, aside from a brief period in the years between 2004 and 2008. Its main use for the longest time was cargo operations, but today it has been transformed into a general aviation airport. The incident of Air Algerie 702 Papa was largely a forgotten disaster in the region. The crash came very close to even further devastation and loss of life. Had the aircraft crashed just 100 meters short from where it ended up, it would have destroyed numerous homes in the process. Had it come down a few hundred meters ahead, the 737 could have crashed onto the A46 and into rush hour traffic. Instead, the plane crashed into the small, wooded area between the two. It is worth mentioning that to some, especially the residents of Willenhall, it is believed that the pilot flying at the time of disaster maneuvered the plane in a way to purposefully miss the homes of residents, saving numerous lives. For years after the accident, an imprint was left on the landscape where the crash occurred. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. I was very surprised at how long this video turned out. I remember writing it up last week and it just got longer and longer. There was quite a lot to unpack here. I guess it was a case of something looking simpler on the surface, but once you dig deeper, there's just more unearthed. But still, the length of the video is the length of the video. I do enjoy it when a video gets longer and I think in terms of raw word count, I think this video has all the others beat. The current longest video on the channel, the South African Airways video, which I'm hoping will be surpassed in a few months, is as long as it is due to showcasing CVR and ATC transcripts. None of that was available here. Anyway, I'm taking the opportunity right now to thank my amazing patrons over on Patreon for their amazing ongoing support. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, a massive thanks to you. If you yourself want to support the channel further, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content 48 hours before it goes out publicly on YouTube. If you are a patron and you want to connect with me or chat with me, I'm always open for messages on there. That is where I'll end things. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to follow my personal Twitter page, that too will be linked in the pinned comment. Have a great weekend and I will see you next week. Goodbye.